40 years ago, the Peace and Friendship Treaty reset the Sino-Japanese relationship. However, disputes over the Diaoyi Islands, the Japanese government's ambiguous acceptance of the historical war crimes like the Nanking Massacre, and the use of comfort women in World War II, coupled with official visitations to the Yasukuni Shrine, still soured relations. Tensions have been heightened by frequent Chinese military training exercises around the Sea of Japan. Presently, governmental exchanges and mutually beneficial economic cooperation maintain cordial bilateral ties. How do we evaluate the current and the future Sino-Japanese relations? Will Japan's participation in China's Belt and Road Initiative strengthen ties? And how will the U.S.-Japanese alliance influence Sino-Japanese engagement? To discuss these issues and more, today I'm happy to be joined in the studio by Rong Ying, who is the Vice President of the China Institute of International Studies, and by Andy Mark, who is the Managing Director of Red Pagoda Resources. We shall also speak to Professor Takasato Watanabe of Dorchester University via telephone in Kyoto. That's our topic. This is a dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. August 12, 1978, in Beijing. Chinese Foreign Minister Huang Hua and Japanese Foreign Minister Sunao Sonoda signed a treaty of peace and friendship between China and Japan. It set a new milestone in the history of Sino-Japanese relations, following on from the joint statement in September 1972 and the normalization of diplomatic relations. The treaty requires two sides to develop durable relations of peace and friendship on the basis of the five principles of peaceful coexistence. Settle all disputes by peaceful means without resorting to the use or threat of force. Develop economic and cultural cooperation and promote exchanges between the people of the two countries. The two parties declared in the treaty that neither of them would seek hegemony and that each was opposed to any other country's efforts to establish such hegemony. Despite its brevity, the treaty took four years to finalize. Diplomatic ties were restored in 1972, and the two sides concluded agreements on trade, aviation, and navigation in 1974, with an agreement on fishing the following year. Negotiations for the Treaty of Peace and Friendship began in 1975. Fourteen quick rounds of talks sealed the details in July, and the process was finally concluded on August 12th. The signing of the treaty opened up a new period of long-term friendly cooperation between the two countries. In the autumn of 1978, then-Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping visited Japan and exchanged instruments of ratification of the treaty. Deng said the conclusion of the treaty further consolidated the foundation of the good neighborly and friendly relations between the two countries and opened up broader vistas for a further increase of exchanges in the political, economic, cultural, scientific and technological fields. He said it would also exercise a positive impact on the maintenance of peace and security in the Asia-Pacific region. Forty years later, in May 2018, Chinese Premier Li Keqiang and his Japanese counterpart Shinzo Abe attended a ceremony in Tokyo marking the 40th anniversary of the signing of the treaty. Both sides said they plan to continue to pursue a peaceful and friendly path. For some time, China and Japan detoured a little, but now we are seeing improvement and relations are becoming sustainable and forward-looking. My visit aims to push China-Japan relations back on a normal path, to maintain the long-term and stable development, and to prevent us from going backward. China is willing to make efforts together with Japan. There is almost nothing that is impossible if Japan and China can hold hands together. I'm confident that we can make a greater contribution to resolve various regional and global issues. Use history as a mirror while looking to the future, Li said during his trip in May. The signing of the China-Japan Treaty of Peace and Friendship paved the way for developing a bilateral relationship 40 years ago, and hopefully it will continue to guide the two countries' peaceful and friendly interactions in the future. Yao Qin, CGTN, Beijing. Welcome to Dialogue, gentlemen. The year 2018, this new year, is very meaningful for the bilateral relationship between China and Japan. But are you cautiously optimistic or the other way around? 
Oh yeah, I think in general I'm quite uh, cautious about the relationship. For cautious, this. optimistic, cautiously optimistic. Cautiously or optimistic. Yeah. Uh, cautiously optimistic about the the overall trajectory or trend of the relationship uh, between the two uh, most important neighbors. And I think, as you rightly said, that this year marks the 40th anniversary of the uh, signing of the uh, French, uh, Peace and Friendship Treaty between the, uh, China and uh, Japan. And uh, that was uh, based on, actually, the, uh, another important uh, uh, document uh, we call the Joint Communique between China and Japan for how the bilateral relationship. How many official, official documents uh, laid the groundwork for the bilateral relationship in the 19, starting from the 1970s? Altogether, we're talking about the four most important political documents that they form the political foundation of the relation. But of course, the, uh, the four principled agreement uh, between China and, uh, uh, and Japan that agreed in, in November 2014 is also important because it reiterates the importance, the, the spirit and the principle of these four princi uh, political documents, which constitute the foundation, political foundation for stable and uh, uh, healthy relationship between China and uh, Japan. And the an observer from outside China, what do you make of the nature of this uh, most important bilateral relationship in Northeast Asia? Well, I'm more optimistic than cautious on this, and I think that uh, the reason for this optimism is that while despite the difficult and troubled past between uh, China and Japan, and this makes me think of what William Faulkner in describing the American South said that the past isn't dead, it isn't even past. And to a degree I think that's been true of the China-Japan relationship that the past still very much animates a lot of the relationship. I think that being said, with Abe uh, securing a new term uh, with Xi Jinping in this new era, uh, that there's a lot of room for optimism that these historical problems can be put behind us and with both countries looking forward to a, a bright and jointly prosperous future, uh, there really is a lot of room for optimism. If you look at the public opinions and the results of uh, public opinion polls, uh, well over 80% in each country are pretty negative about the other side given our serious disputes on territorial claims as well as history. Now let me cross over to Professor Takasato Watanabe with the Dorchester University for his first hand account about uh, whether he shares the optimistic uh, sentiments here or the other way around. Hello. Hello, thank you for your calling. Can I have your quick assessment about the improve or the proposed improvement of this relationship in the new year? Yes. Uh, China Japan and the United States are three biggest economic entities of the world. So if th these three can go hand in hand, the prosperity of economics and also a stability of the politics would be easily realized. However, some forces inside Japan and also uh, Trump administration want to make some troubles among the Three Asian nations are China, South Korea, and Japan. This is the first problem. But another problem is, as the, uh, you have appoint, uh, pointed out, historical understanding between China, Japan, and South Korea. So these are very deeply rooted in the public opinions, and especially in Japan. The media, manipulated a little bit by other Abe administration is utilizing this kind of the issues, especially uh, territorial issues. So if we can consider those problems step by step, I think uh, the future would be not so difficultly manipulated by the power, inside Japan at least. Last December 28th, gentlemen, President Xi Jinping called on China and Japan to enhance party-to-party -party cooperation during the meeting in Beijing with the delegation led by Toshihiro Nikai, Secretary General of Japan's Liberal Democratic Party, the ruling party, and Mr. Yoshihisa 
ignore Secretary General of uh, Comato, LDP's ruling coalition partner. Now, Rongying, has anything fruitful been achieved by this? And what is the current progress of the ruling party's exchange mechanism and its role in boosting the bilateral ties? Oh yeah, I think the party-to-party uh, -party interactions, particularly for the ruling parties, the LDG, LD, LDPs and the Comito ones, uh, they are now having uh, the uh, over two-thirds of uh, majority votes. Uh, in the parliament, in the diet, is very important. It not only, I think, uh, increase the mutual understanding, but more importantly, it, I think, create a better atmosphere for the steady and uh, uh, improvement of the relationship. And as we all know, that the Kaizen has been very uh, active and very, I think, uh, strong support of a steady and uh, healthy relationship between, the China, between China and Japan. So he's, I think he's very well respected, certainly in China, but also I think his voice is becoming louder and bigger in, the, in Japanese politics as the, the, uh, the relationship is in too, too important. And also I think Abison, Prime Minister, is also very much atta attached to, the, to his views uh, in the context of what we have discussed. The issue, I'm afraid, is whether there is a consensus between the uh, coalition partners of the Japanese cabinet and whether there is such a consensus for the lawmakers in the diet about seriously a remarkably improving the strain of the relationship in this new year. I think the, uh, there, as I can see, there's a consensus that uh, Japan needs to have a stable and a, a healthy relationship with China. And do you think uh, this catalyst behind the appeal for improving the relationship actually comes from the U.S. pullout from the TPP and AIIB or Belt Road Initiative? Japan is clearly aware that without this big brother in the Asia Pacific region assuming the leadership, Tokyo has to reconsider seriously its uh, policy of uh, engagement with China. Andy, do you see eye to eye with me? Uh, I think that is a very important point that you know, Japan post-World War II has been the junior security partner uh, in the Asia Pacific region with the U.S. as the senior partner. But I think maybe what's more important too when we look at whether there is a consensus in Japan that I think the uh, the initiative actually lies with China and here the symbolism is very important and matters much more than in a place like the United States where what Trump says and does may or may not represent US policy but in China certainly uh, having uh, Secretary General uh, Nikai speak at the Central Party School uh, is a very important symbol of the direction I think that China-Japan relations is going to take and that that's a very positive signal. Um, and you're absolutely right, I think, Yang Wei, that from the Japanese side, uh, there is the reality that uh, with the U.S. being less important in this region, both in absolute as well as relative terms, uh, that I think China has to, uh, sorry, Japan has to recognize this and accommodate itself to these new geopolitical realities. But the issue of mistrust captures headlines. Uh, when you spoke of a political foundation which were uh, uh, laid by the four official documents uh, over the past three decades, does it mean that we should take uh, the conflicting signals from the Japanese government very seriously? They not only say, hey, buddy, we want to improve relationship with you, but uh, during the process of a geopolitical reconfiguration following pivot to Asia, Junichiro Koizumi in particular called for the building of an arc of freedom and prosperity, which means members of this arc should share the same values. China is obviously an exception, therefore we have been excluded from this club. So the Japanese government has always sent conflicting signals. Oh yeah, I think the importance of these four political documents, why we say they serve, they constitute the political foundation, is because number one, uh, uh, there's, uh, I think, it. Uh, for the uh, within uh, ever since the uh, 1972 the uh, normalization relationship and up to 19, uh, 2008 within that 30 years and more the two countries worked out 
some very important principles how to de manage the relationship I mean two neighbors big neighbors which have difficult history and, and various kind of problems this, this is very important because this is always there I mean among them I think from Chinese perspective it will also uh, uh, to some extent Jap Japanese side also agree is that how to implement as you rightly said with deeds not words mm -hmm. about the the consensus that the two sides view each other as a partner for cooperation, not as a threat to each other's development. And more importantly, the two sides actually has agreement on consensus. They had su support each other's peaceful development. And this is the, the most important thing, I mean, between the two countries on the question of mistrust or distrust. And if the two sides were able to solve this problem, particularly the Japanese side, as the overall balance of power is changing, China is taking over uh, Japan in terms of GD overall GDP, I think this issue becomes increasingly important and prominent. And I think when Japan says, uh, I mean something, the Chinese would like to look at what it does. It is doing something. But the other, the, other, uh, the other equally important thing is the history issues and other issues, how they can, again, there's the commitment, there's also, I think... But uh, I'm afraid, gentlemen, uh, a, 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 a lot of the Chinese started. observers and overseas observers say, hey, you cannot afford to be always mired in your historic memories. You have to move forward. You have to look forward into the future. Now, let me cross over very quickly to Professor Watanabe. Hello. Hello, yes. I believe you've been... Uh, listening uh, to what we are talking about in the Beijing That's studio, right, yes. um, do you agree that the uh, Abe administration has sent uh, very conflicting signals and opinions, uh, not only in the diet but across the spectrum of the public opinions, have been very seriously divided? Do you have a series that agrees to take China seriously, that agrees to take the bilateral relationship very seriously? You see, uh, uh, the people or academics uh, out of Japan may understand th that the uh, LDP of Abe's party is so strong, but actually the number of votes uh, in the last election, the, about the two-thirds majority voted for, you, you know, in reality, the opposition parties. But because of the some distortion of the voting system, uh, that kind of phenomena happened. So uh, Abe's you see, majority supporting rate is not you see, uh, showing the strength of the Abe's uh, political party itself. This is the first thing. Uh, I met with our colleagues of the table tennis team. I met the uh, Premier Cho Enlai. He said, you see, if Japan apologizes the uh, damages given by the war, we don't request Japan to pay the compensation money. This is the principle of the relations between China and Japan. So I am very much optimistic if the people would show clear attitude to be friendly more with the Chinese people and Chinese government. And so the Pre Premier Abe and President Xi Jinping, if he can, they can talk very friendly, seriously on the basis of the spirit of the uh, 40 years ago, I think the relations of the two countries would be, would be very, very good. Thank you so much, Professor Watanabe. Uh, you are watching dialogue with uh, Mr. Rongying, Mr. Andy Mark, and Professor Watanabe. We are addressing prospects of this most important bilateral relationship in Northeast Asia between Tokyo and Japan, because uh, this year, 2018, marks the 40th anniversary of the uh, Peace and the Friendship Treaty, which was signed 40 years ago between the two governments. We'll be back in a short while. Stay with us, please. Welcome back. Uh, a, a few minutes ago, Professor Watanabe said that the principle uh, the Chinese government uh, and the uh, chairman Mao Zedong put forward uh, during the Cold War was very, very, and would say, decisively important for normalization of the relationship. That is, China decided to give up the uh, demand for compensations, the war indemnity. It seems on the official surface, the Chinese authorities uh, seldom mention the issue of the compensation, but individually, 
uh, uh, some of the Chinese uh, went to Tokyo and with the help of Japanese lawyers uh, are still fighting for compensations for their victimhood during the war. Do you think this has somehow prevented the Japanese authorities from moving forward? I think the, the, the issue, uh, this is part of the issue of mm -hmm. history. Yeah? As I said, there, there's, a, there's a position, this is being, uh, 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 being re uh, proved that this is important and it followed the principles. I mean, the history of, of his, the, the question of history could, would be properly managed and resolved. And then related, there are some issues left over, I mean, uh, related to the history. Uh, the compensation is certainly one of them. There are the other issues related to that. How to manage these issues, I think this is also there between the two governments and also between the parties concerned, including individuals, can be resolved. But, but the, uh, the Japanese keep on, uh, but some of the Japanese, particular politicians, keep on, um, I mean, whitewashing or denying the part of history. These issues, sensitive issues, will keep on coming back. Particularly and, uh, uh, remarks from exactly. the right-wing politicians exactly. in uh, Japanese exactly. politics. Yeah. So yeah. I thought that the two they governments... Their tributes to the Yasukuni Shrine, which owns 14 class A war criminals, uh, kept harming the re uh, fragile relationship, uh, leading to the deep mistrust between not only the two governments, but peoples. Uh, however, right-wing politicians cannot represent the majority. Uh, having said this, what do you make of the uh, campaign to rewrite the pacifist constitution? Will that pave the way for the rise of a right-wing uh, nationalists in Japan and therefore do you think uh, the issue of militarism uh, will again make a comeback to the media? Well, I think one would certainly hope not. But I think um, where some of this mistrust comes from is actually structural because, of course, one of the differences between Japan and China is the system of government. So it's much more difficult for a country like Japan to state a position and stick to it. Just like the United States, whenever there's a new administration, you can have 180 degree policy shifts which makes that country a less reliable partner and in that sense that can create a sense of mistrust. So I think we need to recognize that. Um, then you have these fringe elements uh, that hopefully uh, we can see in Europe, uh, other parts of the world, while they have gotten greater recognition and some traction, uh, but it seems like uh, that it might not be as widespread as you know, many fear and hopefully that will be the same in Japan as well. Let's look at the issue of a military build-up and the arms race in Northeast Asia. Obviously, China wants to become a maritime power. Look at the boom of maritime commerce, and we have become the biggest trading power in the world. And part of that, the alleged Chinese ambition, and the West would call that maritime assertiveness, is our very top position on territorial disputes like the Diaoyu Islands and the Nan Dash Line in the South China Sea. So my question for Professor Watanabe is, uh, do you think uh, the regular military drills by the PLA poses a threat, quote unquote, to your national security? And do you think uh, this alleged threat has been abused by the Abe administration to arouse nationalist sentiments to lay groundwork for rewriting the pacifist constitution and to give up Article 9? Uh, as far as the uh, Komeito party has the strong power or influence upon the Abe politics, uh, he cannot do anything. Uh, so uh, this time, I see, as you have discussed already in your studio, uh, Komeito and uh, one of the uh, section leader of the LDP, Ikai-san, went to China. And uh, they said, you see, the importance of the relations of the two countries. But Mr. Abe uh, want to, you see, uh, extend his uh, term next year for another two or three years. So uh, if he wants to do that, he needs the uh, support of the Komeito. So he doesn't want to change, actually, the Constitution, constitution especially Clause 9. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, Rongying, at the end of 2017 last year, the Chinese Air Force held frequent drills and uh, training missions at Tsushima around the Sea of Japan while the Chinese Navy have passed 
several strategic streets like the Miyako Street are Chinese military drills. They are provocative or uncomfortable from a Japanese standpoint. <laughs> I should have asked the Professor Watanabe, but what's the position of the Chinese scholars? No, at all. No, not at all. I think the Chinese uh, military is, it has been and, and that con uh, conducting an normal and routine exercises and uh, the passaging of these uh, straits uh, within the international law, I mean to the right of international law for in passages like that. So I don't think uh, this is an uh, uh, issue from China's perspective. Of course, Japanese has some concerns, Japanese has some And uh, I think it would be right if the, uh, the Ch Japanese military and the Japanese or depart I mean, department concerned to share, to, to, to convey the, if there are any concerns or questions and through right channels, diplomatic channels and, other, and others, rather than through, I think, public media like microphones. And that is not the right way for that. But otherwise, I think China as a, a, a country that is undergoing a kind of dramatic changes and it is uh, uh, undertaking the modernized military modernization programs, so it's only natural, I think, for China's military going uh, out going far and going more frequently. I guess I think the problem for Japan is that it has to make sure to, to get to use that. The last question for Rongying. What do you think of the U.S.-Japan security pact that allegedly covers the nearby waters, uh, which means Taiwan Street? The U.S.-Japan military alliance is in the history. It is, I mean, out. But it is also reality. Yeah, and it is now become a reality. And the question I think from the Chinese perspective is that how this alliance is going to make, provide goods, public goods in terms of the security, stability and the prosperity of the region. Now the question is, this is a big question mark. It is increasingly, I think, uh, creating uh, instead of goods, for me it is bad because they are, they are on the one hand, they, they take it as a kind of a mean to ensure or to maintain their, their dominance in the region and increasingly uh, perceived as against China. China. So I, I, I thought the question of Taiwan is of course it is, this is where, I mean, comes into this equation, all right, and uh, China being very clear, this is uh, part of China and China I think Feels, I mean, even though at the moment we are pursuing a kind of a peaceful, uh, a peaceful development across the strait, a peaceful reunification, but I, I, I think China knows very well uh, the danger and of uh, independence. So this is, but the, 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 so if the alliance is perceived, I think as a kind of a, uh, well agenda or the kind of. A uh, strategy again that 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 will be uh, could become very problematic repeatedly the two sides of Washington Tokyo said the security pact serves as a cornerstone for the regional security in Northeast Asia however the DPRK says it doesn't have the security assurance from the hostile countries on the doorsteps instead it decides to possess nuclear weapons for self-protection with that, we come to the end of this edition of Dialogue, addressing the prospects of a China-Japan relationship in the year 2018, which will witness the 40th anniversary of the Peace and Friendship Treaty, a very important landmark document that lays the groundwork for bilateral relationship. I'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>